story of Jared. <laughs> Good to see you, Jared. All right, for our stay-at-home audience, we've got a little slow start today, but we're we're, we're rolling now. So what like um, bumps in the road today. Yeah, who would like to pray us into uh, Bible study today? I did grace. <laughs> you did grace last night, too. I know. You hit me up twice. Oh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, we thank you for this ability to get together. We thank you, Lord, for the cool night you gave us, the cool breeze coming through the window, and a beautiful morning. Sunlit morning cool breeze. And Lord, we, we get a chance to worship you all day long today. We start with a, a discussion on Christian conferencing, which is getting us together into, into small groups, just like you gathered your first disciples. Lead our actions, Lord. Lead our, lead our thoughts. And show us the way we should go. William says hi. Hi, William. Jared. Yeah, hi. He says, great, thanks. <laughs> So today's scripture comes from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 38. We're going to hear some of that today in today's sermon. Uh, this is from the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, today I'm preaching from the English Standard Version, so slightly different. Um, the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version, a lot of colleges and seminaries like to use that. I don't know why. They got stuck on a version. Maybe they got like a thousand free copies. But uh, anyway, whenever you write papers for seminary, you have to use the new Revised Standard Version. Um, to me, it, it seems kind of sticky. You know, it's it's not always as clear. Um, when I preach, I usually like to use the uh, New Living Testament because New Living Testament uses nice, clear language and it's very descriptive. So, you question. might have to talk up just a little bit. Okay. Well, you're behind the mask, so. Ah, uh, behind the mask. Mm -hmm. So, Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 38. <coughs> then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And that the key verse here in this reading is, then Peter began to speak to them, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable. So really what Peter's saying here is that God wants everybody to be saved. Every nation, so across the world, God doesn't care who they are, what they've done, or what they will do, he wants them saved. Because God always intended to have all of his creation back with him. That's how we started. We started out sinless before Adam and Eve sinned, and that's how God wants us back. That's why he sent us Jesus, to redeem us so we can go back to him. If we chose, because God gives us free will, if, if he forced us to love him, then we would be slaves. He doesn't want that. He wants us to choose to love him. So that's what Peter's saying. God wants the entire world back to him. Now, this is our last week in uh, the Discipleship Sunday School. And what we want to, to take from the classes we've had for our spiritual practices are a couple key takeaways and they're listed here. First off, being a disciple of Jesus Christ will change you. Now we know that, that when we are saved, when we ask God to come into our lives and we repent of our sins, we're changed. We, we can't ever go back to the way we were before. But if we take the next step and become disciples and truly follow Jesus, 
pick up the cross he's laid before us and start doing the works he asks us to, our life really changes. Um, ask anybody who's been a Sunday school teacher or a wanted teacher or, or cooked for a while the change in their life or to join the praise band. Morning, Deb. Don't you love these new chairs? I think they look very nice. Dave picked them up. Where Super were, Dave. Where were they at? I don't know. He, he found Dave walks around with his eyes open. Yeah, he does. He, he sees things in the church that he's fixing. He does it. So he saw these chairs somewhere. They were inexpensive and he knew exactly where to put them. They look comfortable. Are they comfortable, guys? Yes. And, and they've been cleaned. Yes. Yeah. They were drying the other morning. When we oh, were I even love that more. Yeah. yeah. Jean looks so comfortable in it. She looks relaxed. She well, looks, it's a nice height. I see the height. I like that. Yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. It's a good height. It's a, it's a nice color. It sets off your sweater very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> what did you have for today? <laughs> This is my last day before vacation, <laughs> and I really, really need it. So he's getting a little jittery, yeah. We're going to have a meltdown probably yeah. about midnight tonight. And, and like, as, as we were walking, I told Gina, I didn't sleep well last night, so I might be a little slap happy. So I'm, I'm already delirious, Gina. So, You're we, oh, okay. thank you, Jesus. And then we wake up with a phone call. My sister's cat is in the ER. Oh yeah, it just is. In kidney failure. Yeah, and like, she's crying and crying. Well, we've all, well, if you've had a pet, you've been there. Yes. Yeah. It's an awful thing. Yes. It's an awful thing. Yeah. So back to, what, <laughs> back to subject. Sorry, I sorry. <laughs> I digress. So when we finally decide to become a disciple, and not everybody does, our life completely changes because we are transformed through the work we do for God. Uh, no matter what it is. No matter how simple we might think it is, not only are we transformed, but people around us are transformed. Um, you know, we mentioned Dave. Uh, look at look at the changes he's made in the church since he's become um, the steward of the building. Okay, and I do have to add that Deb has taken over the board, which is yeah. incredible. Yep, and training to Yes, so thank you, yep. Deb. Thank you for putting words to new songs in that I'm picking each yep. time. And, and that goes back to thank you, Rocky, for teaching me what I need to know there. So. Yep. Yeah, and so these are the little changes, right? That's how it works. Right. We, we are changed, and we change the people around us. So. And um, our prayer is always that other people will look at the changes within us, and that they might want the same thing. So. And we know that from women's Bible study, because there's been many women yeah. saying, hey, Deb, that really worked, and hey, Deb, I'm changing, and hey, Deb, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. So good, positive Absolutely. things. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that first point is key. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ will change you. And as disciples, we go through life discovering that much of what we thought we knew about how to live is recast in the light of God's claim upon us. We thought that, well, you know, we get up, we go to work, and that's how life is. But then when you start adding God's work to it, all of a sudden, everything opens up. You see, you even see people in a different light. Um, well, you look at them and think, how can I help this person? <laughs> Absolutely. Versus, oh, there, because there's that person. Right. But we see something's wrong with them, and we kind of want to reach out and help them immediately. Yeah. Because we know they're not right. Something's off, yeah. and, and they're having a bad day. Or Instead of walking away, mm -hmm. we want to go and find out. Right. Because we've been transformed by listening to Scripture to know that we should reach out. So, good mm -hmm. point. And we want to illustrate the exciting and sometimes scary, diverse ways in which discipleship draws us into situations where we can introduce others to Jesus Christ. Um, we want to tell other people about it, how our lives are changed, and we, because we want them to have that, that same happiness. But a scary situation? Well, um... Scary, diverse ways. Sometimes it is scary to approach somebody. Oh, okay. And, and tell them your story. Right. Um, and sometimes you change up your story because it needs to fit the situation. You don't change the content of your story, but you sometimes change the way you present it. Um, as part of our lifelong journey as disciples, we're called to step out of our comfort zone to places where God calls us. Same thing. Um, 
maybe we give our testimony no matter where we're at. You know, good morning. Sometimes uh, Chris Longshore will give her testimony when she's at the hospital or in a clinic. Sometimes it can be scary for other people. Um, and <laughs> here you go. I would be willing to, to bet that Peter, Andrew, and the other disciples never dreamed they'd be fishing for anything but Jewish people. Uh, it's something I talked about in my sermon yesterday. Uh, Jesus said, I will, I will make you fishers of men. Well, they were Jewish, and to them, Gentiles were unclean. They couldn't eat with Gentiles. They couldn't uh, go to Gentiles' houses. They could certainly never intermarry. So they thought, well, Jesus is going to have us just go to the Jews. God wants everybody saved. And God even told Isaiah, if you just had to go to the Jewish people, that would be too small of a thing for you to do. Therefore, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. So they had to change the way they thought. And we're going to hear more about that today in the sermon. Um, and we have to wonder if we're guilty of the same narrow view. When Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of, of all nations in Matthew 28, sometimes we think, well, it just means family and friends. Or maybe it means my next door neighbor. Well, what we're finding out now is we have to redefine who our neighbor is. Not just the person who lives next door to us, but that people, the person in the, the trailer court that we might walk away from, or maybe the people in these apartments over here that we have no idea who they are. God is calling us to, to talk to everybody and redefine who our neighbors are. Uh, and our passage today uh, provides some insight into our understanding of discipleship. Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. People don't know that. They won't know that until we tell them. So many people are raised with the idea, maybe through their parents or the legal system, that once you make a mistake, that mistake follows you forever. And we have to tell them God doesn't look at it that way. When God says that you are redeemed, you are forgiven, that means of everything for all time, as long as you repent. So we need to tell people that God forgives everybody. Um, and being a disciple of Jesus means we're being willing to step out of our comfort zone. Jesus wants us to fish for all people. And people means whoever the Holy Spirit leads us to. Later on today, when you read uh, Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 33, you'll see how the Holy Spirit worked not only on Cornelius to tell him to go to Peter, but how the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit worked on Peter to convince him that if whatever God makes is good and clean, forget all your preconceived notions, forget everything you've created in your mind and go to the Gentiles. That wouldn't happen if the Holy Spirit didn't visit Cornelius and Peter. And that's in the first part of chapter 10. Um, so what do we want to do? For the Jew sharing your faith with the Gentile, they carried cultural, religious, and social barriers. Like I said, they couldn't eat with Gentiles, they couldn't go to Gentiles' houses, Gentiles couldn't come to their house. Gentiles couldn't go to the temple. Because if a Jew was with a Gentile, that made them unclean for worship. They couldn't even go to worship if they were with a Gentile. It's almost like they treated it like they had leprosy. Yeah, pretty much. Huh. Yeah, probably, well, probably even worse. Because there was no cure for being a Gentile. But they were a Gentile just because they were born into that. They were not born into the Jewish faith. Exactly. So, exactly. But they couldn't change over. Well, they could be converts. Okay. They could be con they could be converted. Okay. But um, Gentiles, of course, had their own prejudices. The Gentiles 
were Romans and Greeks and other people, and of course they had things against the Jews, just like people now have things against the Jews. And they looked down on the Jews, so there's a pretty good chance that if a Jewish person didn't talk to them about God, then they would still stay away. This is a very cliquish society, just mm -hmm. like it is now. Oh, yeah. There's I mean, no difference. Right. I was like, this is... It parallels us now. Yeah, there's no differences. We, right. we have the same things going on now that they had back then. Right. So, who are who are the Gentiles to us that we're called a witness to? So think about the people that are around you. Who would we consider as Gentiles or undesirables or people that we wouldn't want to talk to? Well, nuns for sure. Non-believers. <laughs> not not oh, nuns. Okay. Nuns. <laughs> Non-believers. They're not... No, 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 no. Don't but get if, me wrong. It's but not. If, but of course, they're called if, nuns, but if you they're ever not. Went to a Catholic school, there's other reasons why you wouldn't want to deal with nuns. They hit you. They beat you. They, they throw erasers at your head. At yeah, you. they're good. They no, were, no, I meant people. And what does nun stand for? Nun. Just nun. They have. They have no beliefs. No beliefs. So Correct. they're called nuns. That would be a good no source to start with. Hmm? That would be a good source to start with. Yeah, and, and it's not that they're undesirable. It's just um, we may not want to approach them because we think they don't want to hear from us. And it's a lot of work. And it's, it's a lot <laughs> of work. like, oh man, I'm in here for life now because yeah. just planting a seed, I got to plant a crop. Well, you know, and, it's <laughs> um, uh, we every United Methodist pastor has access to this program called Mission Insight. So I ran a report on our, our zip code and. I think it said 26% of the people that live in the Cambridge zip code are classified as nuns. Mm. No belief. It's the fastest growing denomination mm. in the world. Mm -hmm. It grows by leaps and bounds every year. The second closest group is Catholic, and I think that was like 22%. But remember, <laughs> that when people say they're a, a certain denomination or faith, that doesn't mean they attend worship. Mm -hmm. It just means that they might have been baptized or their grandmother was a Catholic or their grandmother was a Methodist, so they classify themselves as Methodist. It doesn't mean they attend worship. Right. So the numbers when you're talking about Christianity are usually skewed. They're usually overstated. They happened in Wisconsin a lot. We would do funerals for people who said, oh, my mom went here uh, you know, back in 1902, and hmm. this is where she wants to be. We don't know who these people are. Yeah. You know, I, but I did so many funerals. Oh, I drove past your church. Yeah, yeah that's where I want my funeral. Yeah. Mm. So, <laughs> I, I, I mm. talked to the funeral director. I says, do I, do I get a Christmas bonus this year? <laughs> because I work for you. Yeah, basically, you did crazy. funerals every week for people. So, yeah. That, wow. The, the nuns are the largest and fastest growing group. Mm -hmm. And those are the people we need to reach out to. Because chances are they have no idea who God is. No clue. Mm -hmm. They have misconceptions, what they see on TV, or uh, if a, a pastor gets in trouble, that's their only impression of truth. They have no idea what Jesus actually said. And don't you think that's reflected in society? Oh, no With all doubt. The violence and everything. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. If you read what Jesus says and incorporate it into your life and absorb it, we wouldn't have these problems. We would we would have a respect for life. We, we wouldn't have the troubles we have. But so many people see religion or religious people and they think that that's the way Jesus is. That's what's in the Bible. No. Well. I have to admit, when we were, when I was of an, another denomination, the I never read the Bible except in the Bible stories that we were told growing up. It was a scary thing to look at that book. I go, I don't understand it. I don't want to open it. It's like in Latin to me, mm -hmm. but it's not. Once you get into it and break it down, it's real <laughs> simple. So if there was an easy way, like our Bible 101 class, mm -hmm. can't wait for that to come back, because we took it slowly, right, and. We heard something on the news the other day about Leviticus. I went, oh, I read it. I know what it says. You know, it, it, I felt so good. I right. in, it was involved in the story. Yeah. 
on what he was talking about. Because I'm like, how oh. Many people hear about Leviticus or Deuteronomy and Numbers, and they said, I am. That's just way too. Tough. It's Greek, right? It's Greek to me. I don't but understand. We found it. out as right. we dove into those chapters, into those books, there is so much in there, and so much of it relates to the New Testament and Jesus that it's all tied together. So it's not explained to them. They get these Bibles, because you know when we go into these goodwills and accessibility, what do we find? Bibles. Mm -hmm. That's like the number one book you find. Yeah. And I wish there was a way to make it easy for them to understand the Bible. It's not hard at all. But so the only thing is, the only way a person can understand the Bible is if he has the Holy Spirit. But they don't understand that. But the thing is, we, we have to... That's why we have to... We have to introduce it to them. Right. We have to introduce it to them. Mm -hmm. We have to have them accept Christ. Because otherwise, it is all Greek. Because they don't understand. Because they don't have the Holy Spirit instructing them. Mm -hmm. But we, we always have to remember that we need to present this with love. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, some people have used this as a bludgeon, mm -hmm. as a weapon. Mm -hmm. And we can't do that because nowhere in here is should be presented as a weapon. I think the biggest help for me on my journey has been I don't have to read the King James Version. Amen. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. that is Greek to me. Mm -hmm. And now we have simpler, not simpler, but easier to read versions. Right. And I know you've said be careful which ones, you know, because there's a little quirk here and there. But I mean, if I have a question, I go to you or I go to you. Yeah. Maybe okay. what I can do too, I was just thinking when she said that is present it like, you know, there is this great app that will read those stories to you on right. on your phone. Right. And you can just listen to it and then, you know, I mean there's so much out there. Um, even in all kinds of languages from uh, Gideons. Yeah. And you go to there and you say, okay, I feel lonely. And it reads the past, uh, passages to you in the Bible to help you through your loneliness right. Right. it and I was trying to tell the Iwana kids that I gave them a list of all the things as you go through anxiety loneliness um, you know feeling bullied what to read in the Bible to help them and that and that's another good point because uh, so many people don't look at the Bible as a daily help it's a go-to book